The Acolyte is a queer Marxist vandalization of the myth of Star Wars. In The Acolyte, the Force is a metaphor for cultural hegemonic power. The Jedi are a metaphor for cisgender white oppressors who hoard the power for themselves. Yes, it really is that obnoxious and stupid. Says this blue checkmark dickhead on Twitter. The woke left strikes back in Star Wars The Acolyte by getting rid of the Trade Federation's iconic racist Chinese accents ripped straight from an episode of South Park. Uh, the, uh, mechnics are on it, Captain. Ah, the grease grubbers are disposable. Do you think she suspect an attack? I don't know, but we must move quickly to disrupt all communications down there. Never forget what they took from you. With the shaky and unpredictable force that is streaming, anytime there is ever a new Star Wars show, people always want to know how much money it actually made Disney. But personally, I'm way more interested in learning how much this show has made the usual anti-woke suspects here on YouTube. Sadly, I don't have those figures, and this video is not about the anti-woke hooligans and all of their hoopla. That'll be my next upload, hopefully. I've got the script ready to go, I just haven't made the video yet. And none of you are shocked to hear that, but hey. What are you gonna do? The Acolyte premiered its first two episodes a few days ago, which means I should finally have an answer to the question I've been asking myself for a while now, and that is, will I like this show? The answer? I still don't know. I was never excited for The Acolyte. I don't really get excited for new Star Wars or Marvel or DC or anything in life, really. I think that's just part of being an adult living in society. Even when it comes to the stuff that I'm really into, the sensational feelings of great anticipation and getting hyped aren't really there. I kind of just look forward to stuff when I hear about it, and then forget about it, then remember it, and think, oh, yeah, cool, that's a thing. If I'm being honest, that is something I never even felt once for the Acolyte, but mainly because it was Star Wars. There's like a hundred different things coming out, or are supposedly going to come out at some point, and none of them excite me. With one exception. More than anything, I was intrigued by The Acolyte. A show set 100 years before The Phantom Menace, when the Jedi are at the height of their power, sounds like a pretty interesting time period. And with so many new projects recycling the same material with a new paint job slapped on it and keys being jingled in my face in the way of raw, authentic, and original storytelling, I want something new from Star Wars. Just let me go about my day losing my own will to live, then tuning into the newest Star War on Disney+, Plus, only to have the visuals and sound blow up my entire living room. If God is real, not even he knows when Ryan Johnson's trilogy is getting made. If ever. The Acolyte is set in a new time period, it stars completely new faces, and it's not connected to... whatever the fuck Favreau and Filoni are cooking up over on that end of the timeline. Again, I wasn't excited for this show. I didn't have any expectations going into it, I was just curious to see how I'd feel after watching it, and... I don't feel much of anything. Spoilers ahead for the first two episodes of Star Wars The Acolyte. For all of its flaws, The Acolyte feels like a Star Wars TV show. Yeah, no sh**, you just thought to yourself. I know it literally is that, but I mean from an artistic lens and framework of critique. This feels like a show that George Lucas would have made in, like, 2009. The Mandalorian is a weekly adventure series and or is an adult drama, and The Acolyte is a Star Wars TV show. Since this show was at the center of online culture war debate before even the first trailer dropped, everyone is clocking in at the opinion-having factory, and some are really putting in overtime. From what I've seen on social media, I get the impression that a lot of people either really like this show or they absolutely despise it. This is either the best thing in Disney-era Star Wars, or it emasculated you and tried to make you feel guilty for being white. I don't know, I'm a normal person. After watching the first two episodes, my only reaction was... Yep, that's a TV show, alright. The Acolyte starts off pretty strong, that much I will admit. Seeing Carrie Ann Moss as a Jedi is pretty cool. Her character was interesting. It's a shame that has to be said in the past tense. One thing I noticed right away is how grainy this show looks. Maybe you didn't notice, or did notice, and just chalked it up to the compression, or maybe you finally accepted that there was a reason that TV was so cheap on Black Friday. Even those of you with 8K displays are going to be seeing grainy footage. The footage I'm using in this video is the highest quality footage you can get on Disney+. Plus. I haven't seen this confirmed by anyone working on the show, but I'm pretty sure they used Dehancer or something similar to make the show look like it was filmed on 35mm film. In other words, they made it look grainy on purpose to emulate the look of The Phantom Menace, which is cool, I guess. Since this show is a prequel to the prequel trilogy, we get to meet new characters in familiar settings, like Jedi Masters in the Jedi Temple on Coruscant. Jedi Master Soul, played by player 456 from Squid Games, is this era's Qui-Gon Jinn, and I think it's pretty cool that he learned English for this role. 
His performance is a series highlight, but so far there's not much else that really stands out to me, which I think is both a good thing and a bad thing. The inherent negative here is that there's not much I can give praise for, which, trust me, I want to. But the good thing, I guess, is that there's nothing overwhelmingly offensive or off-putting about the show. It's not mindless slop or hard to sit through, it's just not doing anything really exciting, which is why I feel pretty underwhelmed and indifferent as of right now. But I'll get back to that toward the end. Because there are things I noticed or felt while watching, and I'm curious to know how many of you agree or disagree. So with this being a prequel to the prequels, The Acolyte is doing its own thing with its own style, but within an environment that feels familiar and full of prequel nostalgia. For example, the dialogue. The Star Wars prequel trilogy is a trilogy that consists of three movies because that's what makes a trilogy a trilogy. And in this trilogy, the dialogue is fucking atrocious. George Lucas is not very good at writing dialogue, and he's arguably even worse at directing his own actors on set. But since I was born 69 days before Attack of the Clones hit theaters, that's not a joke by the way, I googled the dates for this bit and it's just a coincidence. Nice. My birth is what you might call a right place, right time moment, as I join many of you in Gen Z as the kids bless with endless prequel merchandise and propaganda aimed at convincing me that these movies were good and that I liked them. So even though The Phantom Menace bores me to death, and Attack of the Clones makes me question if I'm aromantic and asexual, these are the movies that I grew up watching. And as a result, my brain has adapted to hearing this audible dog sh** and accepting that this is how people talk. So it was almost jarring to hear the Jedi in the show talk like normal people would actually talk. Like the first interaction between Soul and... I don't remember this lady's name. Sorry, I gotta consult the Wikipedia. Give me a second. My biggest takeaway from this has been that I really need to read the High Republic novels. I'm listening to the Thrawn audiobooks right now, so I guess I'll get to those after. But anyways, her name is Vernestra Rowe. She was also occasionally nicknamed Vern, although she disliked it. Wait, Vern. Like, the turtle from Over the Hedge? Damn. The resemblance is uncanny. During the first scene with Sol and Vernestra, I couldn't shake this weird feeling caused by hearing these Jedi have a somewhat normal conversation in a time and place in close proximity to the movies where almost every performance is so lifeless and cringeworthy that some people unironically believe that this was intentional because it's Shakespearean. Sol, my dear friend, how lucky these younglings are to have such a compassionate teacher. I'm the fortunate one to be taught by them. I remember when you were that small. You were so shy. This honestly feels like George Lucas wrote the dialogue, but the director reminded them before filming that they're supposed to interact with each other the way normal people would. And just in case there was any confusion, to not stand around acting stoic all the time. Not exclusive or unique to Lucas-like dialogue, the dialogue in The Acolyte is a little questionable, sometimes. For example, in this scene with Sol and Vernestra, there's a moment where they both acknowledge the importance of and need for discretion during the investigation into the murder of a fellow Jedi. And with the show being set during a time when the Jedi are at the height of their power, but only a few generations away from their eventual downfall, it's no surprise then that there would be some people out there with not very favorable opinions of the Jedi. And to address this fact, we get an exchange that I feel is a little ham-fisted. If it were to become public that a former Jedi killed one of our own, our political enemies could use it against us. Discretion is important. Our justice swift, an example made. Obviously, this is not a death sentence for the show, and you might not even agree with me when I say that's a little ham-fisted, but it comes across to me as dialogue written by a room full of writers who don't feel very confident about their own audience's ability as viewers to pay attention and listen and interpret things. Like, you keep Vernestra's line, and all Sol has to do is acknowledge with his body language. As far as questionable dialogue goes, that is hardly the worst of it. In The Force Awakens, everyone wants to go back to Jakku, and in The Acolyte, everyone wants to mention the fire on Brendok. Even in this scene, Sol says he doesn't see a reason for his former Padawan to kill Carrie Ann Moss and Vernestra says the evidence against her is strong. So he tells her about the time that he and Carrie Ann Ma saved her from a fire on Brendock, and Vernestra, being someone who remembers those events, tells him, I remember. When Sol talks with Osha, we get another reference where he straight up says, I've made peace with what happened on Brendock. And honestly, I'm willing to write this off as the writers just desperately wanting the audience to remember the names of these planets. I can't think of anything else that would explain why the names of planets are repeated so frequently, especially when it doesn't sound natural. Like in episode 2, they're on a planet named Olega. And once it's mentioned the first time, it's said repeatedly, as if to signal to me that I should be taking notes. Where? Olega. Is that the cause for Olega? Olega? Torben is on Olega. Setting course for Olega. 
towards the end of the episode, they're on Olega trying to stop Mei from escaping, and their objective is simply to stop Mei from escaping because she's their murder suspect. Seems simple enough. But somehow the show knew that I was actively watching instead of taking notes with pen and paper, so they decide they need to remind me what planet they're on, and it doesn't sound natural at all. Copy that. We are headed to the city gates. We have to stop Mei before she escapes from Olega. Later on, there's a scene where Sol is asked by the girl from Logan, who also happens to be his current Padawan, how well he knew Occupational Safety and Health Administration, I mean, sorry, OSHA. And instead of answering her question with a short response like, I knew her very well, we were very close, and allowing Daphne Keen to pry a little and maybe ask what happened, which would then make his actual response feel less ham-fisted, it plays out like this. How well do you know OSHA? 16 years ago, I was posted on our home planet, Brandog. I was there when her sister started a fire that killed her entire family. Osha was the sole survivor. I took her as my Padua. You know, for all the sense it made logically to have someone in the writer's room who had never seen Star Wars to question the decisions being made by people who are all fans, I'm gonna have a hard time forgetting that behind the scenes fact, especially when there are moments where the issue isn't that people speak when they shouldn't or speak too much about one thing, but when people should say something and they don't. Exhibit A. Jedi Master Soul's former Padawan, Osha Anasea, is the prime suspect in the murder of a Jedi Master. Upon learning of her potential involvement, Soul is visibly taken aback, suggesting that he is going to struggle with his attachment to Osha, a thing which, as a Jedi, he's not supposed to have. Something that even Vernestra comments on. I see I have underestimated your attachment to her. Now leading the investigation, Soul is accompanied by Jeki, his current Padawan, and a guy named Yord. Okay. In Episode 2, Yord protests to Sol that they must restrain Osha as she's still the prime suspect in the death of Master Indara. Sol tries to reason with him using the information they currently have available to explain to him why it doesn't make sense that Osha could have killed her. And he tells Yord this. Don't let fear affect your judgment. Maybe I'm the only one, but I was fully expecting Yord to ask Sol if perhaps his attachment to Osha is affecting his judgment. Instead, he says nothing. And the very next scene is where they get irrefutable proof that Osha could not have killed Indara. So had Yord made that kind of comment, Sol would have come back into the following scene armed with information that proves beyond a reasonable doubt that his judgment is in fact not clouded. Whether or not Sol's judgment is being affected by his attachment to Osha is up for debate, but I don't think there's any question that it's being affected by something at least. In the same scene in which Sol exposition dumps about his backstory with Osha, Tajeki, and Yord, the twin theory is presented for the first time. But Sol shoots this theory down and says that Mei is dead. That was her name. Mei. I'm not stating that fact for you as the viewer watching this video, that's just his dialogue. Do you think that- No. Mei is dead. That was her name. Mei. I saw her die. Anyways, two and a half minutes pass and Sol finds Osha and we get this scene. May is alive. I believe you. All right then. Did his attachment to Osha cloud his judgment? Is he stupid? Who's to say? In episode two, Sol is about to give Osha a blaster when debate pervert Yord chimes in with his um actually this violates blah 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 blah. To which Sol says to Yord, who remember was a Padawan alongside Osha before she left the Jedi Order. So Osha knows how to use one of these. She used to be a Jedi. Yeah, I think he knows that. I mean, we've already established that Sol will just say things that people already know in reference to Osha, so maybe his judgment really is clouded, but if you ask me, I think he might just be stupid. To be fair and balanced, it's only been two episodes, so there is still plenty of time for the dialogue to improve. Or get worse. And in all honesty, it's not that bad. To most of you, this is me nitpicking. One thing I will say, and although minor, I don't consider this to be a nitpick, is that this show uses so many goddamn screen wipes and transition effects. I'm not accusing anyone of using AI to make this show, but the constant wipes and fades make it seem like machine learning processing the fact that Star Wars screen wipes are iconic as common knowledge, and just throwing it on the timeline for every time the scene changes. In reality, I'm sure there's just so many because of nostalgia. This pastime encourages sentimentality and nostalgia, and both of these emotions can lead- The irony here is not lost on me. Unlike my favorite transitions from the movies, which are iconic because of their general presentation, my favorite transitions in The Acolyte are the ones that stuck out to me. And if something stuck out to me, it probably wasn't for a good reason. I didn't even start to notice the transition effects until Osha exits the crash site to chase after this figure, and I don't know, I just thought this was funny. And 
and you may disagree, but there were times where there'd be a transition effect that felt like it was one or two seconds too soon. The first episode ends with a cliffhanger, literally, and the effect being there isn't the issue. The only problem I have with this scene is that the effect happens too quickly, I feel. But an acolyte... An acolyte kills without a weapon. An acolyte kills the dream. This ending scene, in general, feels goofy. The narration, the random lightsaber activation, then the premature ending transition made me do the light nostril exhale and audibly say... Okay. The premature transition happens again during the scene with Osha and the Jedi, right after Sol told the guy who was friends with Osha when they were both Jedi that Osha used to be a Jedi. Of course. Again, it's just how I read the scene. When I see that, I can't help but think that that scene should have been at least one, maybe one and a half seconds longer. Arguably the funniest transition happens later in the episode during Soul's fight with Mei, and it, it... I'm just gonna play the clip. Awkward iMovie transition effect aside, why the f is Yord using binoculars to watch them fight from the balcony directly above them? Is he stupid? Part of me wants to say the reveal of Osha having a twin sister going around and murdering the Jedi is stupid, but it's only stupid if it was ever meant to be a twist, and it never really was. Aside from Amanda Stenberg being on the poster twice, it seems like they at least made an effort to not let it be known during the marketing that this story involved twins. At least enough of an effort to erase the subtitles for a TV spot upon realizing they spoiled the fact that these two are not the same characters. Since Osha and Mei being twins was never meant to be a big twist in the show's mystery, I'm left wondering what the big twist will be. And even after just two episodes, I feel pretty confident in saying that there won't be any. The mystery in the show is the same mystery in the trailer. Who is behind this mask? Although this is presented as a big mystery in the show, I don't think it's much of a mystery. If you don't want even potential spoilers for the show, thank you for watching, I guess, have a nice day. And if you're staying because you're confident in the odds of me being wrong or you just don't care, thanks for sticking around. So the big mystery that we're supposed to spend the next few weeks debating over and speculating about is that this guy is this guy. Yeah. And I know what you might be thinking, okay Rem. I get why you would think that. Sure, he subdues May in close quarters with ease and goes on like nothing just happened, but it's a little too obvious, don't you think? This guy is obviously a red herring. And to that, I would say, I know. I also agree. But I also believe that May finding out her friend Kamir was her master the whole time is not going to be the big reveal of the series. The big reveal, you see, is that upon doing his face reveal, Kamir will tell May, yeah, so I'm your master, but I'm not the master. TLDR, I have a master myself, and we're gonna work together to kill him. Then I'll go from the apprentice to the master, and you'll become my apprentice, no longer just an acolyte. And you know what's even crazier to me? If this happens, sorry, not if, when this happens, it won't be a big twist or reveal. Am I really supposed to be shocked to learn that this guy is not the one in charge when Leslie Headland herself has said that there's a Sith Master, a Sith Apprentice, and in the deep EU there's a concept of an Acolyte, which is underneath Apprentice. The point I'm trying to make is that this show is trying to build up mystery around the Sith and who all is lurking in the shadows or behind the curtain, and I don't feel any of that mystery. I'm hardly even intrigued. They're also trying to draw my interest with the fire on Brendok, but I don't fucking care. I'm pretty sure we're gonna see the entire thing in episode 3, so even if I did care, no I don't. These first two episodes were not bad, but they were also not great. They're just episodes of television. I don't have any strong feelings about the Acolyte one way or the other, which like I said before is both a good thing and a bad thing. Though if I'm being honest, I think if this show stays being mid or average or god forbid slightly below average, the show will be all the much worse. It's simply a result of what the show is, who made it, who it stars, when it's set, and the state of pop culture that it was released into. Personally, I don't think the Acolyte can afford to be mid or average. When there are people using this show's existence to launch their careers as commentators and media critics, big quotes there, it's simply not enough to deliver something that is just okay. By the end of episode 2, there was nothing that had me hooked or invested in the story. This wasn't terrible, but the bar is in hell. There's nothing here that makes me want to keep watching aside from the fact that this is Star Wars. Honestly, if I weren't a Star Wars fan, I'd probably shrug off that premiere and do anything else but watch episode 3 the following week.